Ladies and gentlemen, would you please welcome to the Voodoo Room, Gaylene McKinney. Gaylene McKinney, right? Is that correct how I pronounce your surname? Yep, yep. Gaylene McKinney. McKinney. Is that an mm-hmm. Irish or a Scottish surname? It's actually Scottish. Okay. How does, I'm going to ask you that question anyway. How did Scottish come into your world? Uh, well, unfortunately, it wasn't a good way. <laughs> it was, uh, it, it, it was actually, um, the owner, the original, uh, McKinney was named Scott and he was, uh, the owner that gave us our name, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So was that, was that, uh, how many hundreds of years was that? Uh, that, that, that goes back. Probably my, I guess my great, 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 great. Wow, that's a lot of greats. <laughs> Granddad, yeah, yeah. And uh, did any of the Scottish culture sort of transition into your, you know, current way of living? Uh, I Is think that where look, the music come from, do you reckon? Like, you know how all Scots and Welsh are really good at singing and um yeah well it is and i mean the whole family is musical so uh they may not all do it for a living but they all are are very musical uh and and we we uh i don't know if the tradition of how i don't know how scottish families are but i know our family is very close and we you know we we uh we spend a lot of time together but that that could be both African and Scottish tradition. I don't know, but <laughs> but yeah. So uh, you I don't know. Have you toured Scotland? I have never been, and I would love to go. Yeah, Thank I'd you. love to check it out. Mm. Yeah, have you well, have you been? I have. I did the jazz festival there a couple of years. Oh, you know, before I started at Birds, I did the uh, Edinburgh Jazz Festival. Okay, and. All right. um, be prepared when you go there in summer, if you happen to go there during their summer, um, because you'll still need a scarf. Oh. Make sure you take a scarf. So it's, it's cold, huh? Well, you know, they call 20 degrees is really hot. Celsius. That is funny. Yeah. Celsius, Celsius, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of playing music, how did you go about creating music with your band straight ahead? What's the process that you guys go through when you're recording or playing? Uh, well, there's, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you mean as far as the actual show or before the, the actual yeah, show? Yeah, whatever. You know, what's the process is that it, it's more about the creating the music, like uh, if you're writing together or you're um, rehearsing together, you know, any okay. of those type of processes. Uh, yeah, so I know uh, when we're re- when we're creating, um, like if someone brings a song to the the band, uh, the process is like we'll try to play through it, and then we'll see what's working and what's not working, and everybody kind of puts their little input in, um, but the composer ultimately has the the last say. But everybody uh, usually when it, people when we all make suggestions, those suggestions uh, will go in unless it just doesn't work. And then uh, after after we work it all out, we rehearse it to make sure that we all uh, understand what's happening and know the form. And uh, and after we run through it, then it's you know it's a done deal. It's, it's the piece is created, you know. So. Uh, yeah, that's basically how we how we work, and we and it's nice to to uh, work as a collective like that, because it it really enhances the the music. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you came from a musical background, like you said. How how did how did this influence you in becoming a musician? You know, I I had many influences. You know, uh, growing up in the house, and and the big one of the biggest uh, influences that came through the house. Uh, was a tall, lanky man who had a stick bag, and uh, I, I I noticed that he had a stick bag. So I was about ten or eleven. So I decided to go talk to him. And to make a long story st- short, short, 
I wanted a pair of sticks that he had in his bag because they were red. <laughs> and, and I was I was very intrigued by that. And uh, I was sitting really close to him, like very, you know, kids don't have a sense of personal space. So I was very close. So he kind of was looking at me out the corner of his eye, like, what, what are you doing here? <laughs> and I, you know, I finally managed to ask him, hey, can I have those drumsticks? <laughs> He's, he looked at me, he said, you want my drumsticks? I said, yeah, yeah, I, I like those, they're red. <laughs> and he said, uh, okay. Well, I tell you what, I'm gonna give you my drumsticks, but you have to listen to me first. And so I said, okay, all right, that's, that's fair. <laughs> so he just said something very simple. He said, I want you to remember the melodies of every song. And I said, the melodies? He said, yes, the melodies. And I said, hmm. Okay, but why? Because I play drums. He said, because most drummers just think about the rhythm. I want you to think about the melody too. And when you take drum solos, people will know where you are. And I said, oh, okay. And then I, there was a slight pause that I said, hey, can I have those drumsticks? <laughs> so he said, go on, girl, take these drumsticks, get all out of here. And so the person I found out later who gave me the drumsticks. This was now later, when I say later, this was about when I was 17, about seven years later. I was looking through a book with my friend, uh -oh, with my friend who was a drum, who was a drummer as well. And we were looking and discovered that uh, the drummer who gave me the drumsticks was actually Max Roach. Wow. <laughs> so I was, I was, when I saw that in the book, I was looking at the picture and I said, Wow, that's the guy that gave me the drumsticks. And my friend didn't believe me. He thought I was he thought I was telling the story. I said, No, no, I'm telling you, this is the guy that gave me the drumsticks, and he told me to remember the melodies of every song. And um, I was I was stunned to find out who who he was, and and also a little disappointed because I thought, Ooh, I had his drumsticks in my possession, <laughs> and I I played with them until they were little piles of wood chips on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So, so I really wish I, I would have been able to to, to have a, a, kept that as a memento. But I'm sure I did with with I did what he wanted me to do with the sticks, which was play with them. And that was my intention when I got them was I was going to play with them. So, and I I got to see him uh, oh about another ten years later, maybe maybe fifteen years later. Uh, by this time, Straight Ahead was signed to Atlantic Records. And we ended up opening for Max at the uh, at here in Detroit at the Fillmore Theater, which used to be the State Theater. And I walked up to him doing sound check I, after after we got done with our sound check. He was standing there looking at us, and I went over there, and I said, "Now I know you don't remember me, because we're talking at least oh I don't know 15 years ago. So I know you don't remember. But and before I could finish what I was saying, he said, "Oh, I remember you." You're that little girl that took my drumsticks. <laughs> and I told him, I said, I said, I said, and I laughed. I said, I can't believe you remember that. He said, Oh, yeah, I remember. He said, You're Harry McKinney's, you're Harry McKinney's daughter. So uh he uh I told him, I, I said to him, I said, I just want you to know that I do remember what you told me. And I said, it is a very integral part of my playing. I said, I, it, it, I remember, I said, I, I know the melodies of many, 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 many songs, you know? So I said, it, I said, I did pay attention to what you said. And I, I said, and I, I said, I really appreciate it that you told me, I really appreciate that you told me that. And he said, he smiled at me. He said, good. <laughs> so yeah, so that you know, the, the, so my household was full full of music. You know, it was just there was people coming in and out. I met Herbie Hancock through my dad. Um, I met I met so many people growing up through through my father, and uh, him being a musician. And so, so he was, I, a, was he was a professional musician playing. Is that yes. is that his main vocation? That, that was his main. Yes, that was his main thing. Um, uh, he he was in his young days. He was he played with people like uh, he toured with Gene Krupa, and he actually played a little bit with John Coltrane, mm -hmm. and he did a, a show with uh, Billie Holiday. Yeah, so he was he was deep in it. <laughs> so so was that in, so you you 
he he lived in Detroit during that time. Yes. Yep. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Detroit. So yep. So answer your question. That there's I don't know what else I would have been doing. <laughs> Because that sort of takes me to the next question, because uh, you were raised in Detroit. It was once known as a Mecca city. What significant changes have you noticed since the Motown period and the GFC period? What was the last, the, the what, JFC? The GFC, the Global Financial Crisis. Oh, oh well, you know, I, I wish I would have. I, I could. I, I kind of wish I would have experienced what it was like to uh, be a musician in the Motown days, uh, because uh, that's when Detroit uh, musicians could they could make a living. You know, uh, every day uh, of the week, and then you not only that you had you had shows uh, that were coming through. Uh, national artists who would might pick up a Detroit musician, and so it was, you know, it was a booming town mm -hmm. musically. Um, now it's it's kind of making its way back to a booming town musically. Um, there's a new new clubs that have opened up that have live music, but one of the main things that happened was uh, in the music scene was a lot of the clubs closed. And also you couldn't get those long, you know, week long gigs or, or month long gigs or lifetime gigs anymore. It was, you know, it was, it was this thing where they wanted to get, have a new artist every weekend or a new artist. You get a, you get a week long gig there at, the, at a club. And then the next, you know, then that's it. You might not get hired back in that club till a year later, you know? So that's one of the biggest differences is that, the 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 length of time that you used to be able to play or when you got a club date has been shortened greatly and uh and of course there's a lot of clubs that have uh closed that were back back open back in the day they're gone now and so it's not that many venues as it used to be um but that being said, it's still Detroit is still viable and full of musicians that are, uh, you know, still trying to work. You know, the, of course, the, the pandemic slowed everything down. So uh, we haven't been able to. In fact, I just started working uh, a club this yesterday uh, because uh, our, our state was closed down um, in November to stop the curve. Mm -hmm. So that was to shut all the clubs down and everything. And some, some clubs didn't make it. So that might've hurt us a little bit as far as, uh, you know, the scene mm -hmm. musically. Yeah. It kind of, it kind of disrupted things, but it's still a vibrant musical city because there's musicians, young musicians that are still coming up, you know, in, in the, in the, uh, in the ranks. So it's, it's, you know, despite what's happening, you know, kids, kids are, we still getting re recruiting kids basically to play music. They still, they coming up strong, you know, especially in the jazz field. Uh, they coming up strong. There's a lot of young, young cats out there who are really um, coming into their own. So, and, and Detroit has a good mental, a me, not mental, a uh, mentor, we have a good mentorship uh, in Detroit because um, the people, just like the people mentored me, uh, my predecessors before me mentored me, my generation of, of uh, musicians, we're starting to mentor younger younger musicians. And so that's one thing I've always been glad about, uh, about Detroit is that you know, we don't have we don't have that uh, mentality that oh you're gonna you're gonna take my spot so I'm not I'm not teaching you anything you just have to find out on your own like I did you know <laughs> we don't have that mentality we 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 take them under our wing and groom them and teach them and and then when they start you know if they work hard and practice and start to get good then we actually start pulling them into gigs <laughs> so. You know, after you know, they get the whole gamut. They, they get mentored, and then you start working. <laughs> so uh, that's the one thing I could say that's as good about Detroit, even though the, the the scene itself is a little tough, you know, right now. 
Yeah. What stands out most for you about working with Aretha Franklin and how did you, how did working with Aretha come about for you? Oh, well, the way that came about, first of all, uh, you know the man. <laughs> uh, well, let me start. Let me start from the, the, the beginning with Aretha. Um, I actually met Aretha when I was seventeen through my father. He casually told me one day that because I was I was doing gigs with my father, so he casually mentioned to me one day, "Hey, sweet tart, we have a gig this Friday." And uh, yeah, it starts at so and so and such and such a time, and blah blah blah. I said, okay, well, where is it? And he said, it's at Aretha Franklin's house. <laughs> and I looked at him. I said, what? He said, yeah, yeah, it's at Aretha Franklin's house. And I said, Dad, I I didn't know you knew her. And he said, oh yeah, yeah, we go way back, way back. I said, really? He said, yeah, things you don't ask your parents because you take them for granted, so you never ask them about their life. So, <laughs> so. Uh, so we did a gig at her house. It was a little, she was giving a party and I met Aretha's sister and brother, brother Cecil and Caroline. And, you know, it was, it was a nice little party. So then later, uh, in 2004, she, uh, she was doing a, a show at, at the Detroit Jazz Festival. And she was doing two halves of a show. The first half was a jazz half, because you know she started out as a jazz singer. And then the second half was her R and B show. Well, she hired me to do the jazz half. Because I, I don't I honestly I honestly don't think she knew that I could play R and B. So she yeah, she hired me to do the jazz half. And then her regular drummer, Nate, did the other half, the R and B half. <laughs> so that was cool. That was fun. And and she, you know, she called me out on stage and I guess I must have been playing something good. She said, Yeah, she look at Gaylin. <laughs> Go. <laughs> so I, that made me feel good. I said, okay, I'm doing a good job. Uh so then um fast forward now to 2016, uh I get a call from I'm driving, I'm driving down the street and my, my, my cell phone rings. And so I kind of glanced at it and it said no name. And I'm like, mm -mm, I'm not answering that. <laughs> I don't answer no name calls. But then this little birdie in my head said, you should answer that. And I, and I said, uh, okay, maybe I will answer that. So I answered the phone and she said, Gaylin. I said, Yes, because she sounded like my mother. <laughs> and I was like, huh? <laughs> she said, this is Aretha. And I'm driving. I'm like, Aretha, Aretha, who? And then she said, I guess the silence must have told her that I didn't know who it was. She said, Aretha Franklin. I said, Aretha Franklin? I said, oh, my God. Okay, hold on. Hold, hold, hold on. I got to pull over. <laughs> Let me pull over. I won't have an accident right now. <laughs> so I pulled over and uh she said, I said, uh, I said, hey, I said, hi, what's 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 going on? And then she said, Yeah, so I'm getting ready to go on tour and I want you to be the drummer and we got rehearsal and these are the songs and she just rattled off. <laughs> she rattled off a whole bunch of stuff. And at the end of it, I'm trying to type stuff in the phone, and at the end of it, she said, Okay, so I'll see you Tuesday. And uh, I said, okay. And uh, come to find out uh, how, how the reason, how she, how she got my number was that, uh, because mind you, the first time she hired me in 2004, I, I just got a call from her manager. I never got a call from her personally. Mm -hmm. This time it was a personal call. So I, I, so I found out from, from uh, later that the reason why she got my, had my number was because of Ralph, mm -hmm. Ralph Armstrong. So Apparently, she called Ralph and asked Ralph. She said, Ralph, uh, this is what Ralph told me. Uh, Ralph, do you think uh, Galen can handle this gig? And blah, 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 blah. And uh, he said, oh, yeah, call her up. Of course, call her up. And so he said, she said, well, give me her number. <laughs> so that's how that happened. And then uh, that began my, my uh, three-year journey with her, the last three years of her life. And it was a great experience. And she actually, 
she actually confirmed that my my father and her had gone way back because out of the blue one day she sent me a text and, and it's, she said, uh, yeah, you know, your father taught me some chords. He taught me a lot of chords back in the day. And I said, really? And I said, I said, I, thank you for sharing that. <laughs> yeah, because she she played she played a lot of piano too. She was a, she was yeah. a good piano player too. And so she yeah she confirmed that her and dad knew each other. And I was like, wow. As as far as her music goes, she was very serious about yeah. her music. Sure. I mean, Ralph Ralph will tell you if you didn't play her music right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> out you go, yeah. Out you go, yeah. Out you go, and uh, and so I, I tried to really make sure that I studied it, you know, her music really thoroughly, and uh, you know, play it, play it the way she wants to be heard. You just released your new CD, Zoot Suit Funk. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Well, um, the last project I released in eighteen called McKinfolk. That was a project of my father's music. And, you know, I did a bunch of rearrangements uh, on his music. This CD uh, is a project of my music. And so I tend to write on the funkier side of jazz, uh, more so than the uh, traditional side. And um, mainly because my, my chords on the piano, my father, you know, he had all these grand chords and, you know, uh, diminished this and flat that and, <laughs> you know, and my my chords uh, structures, structures are a little simpler, which leans me more towards the funkier side of jazz. And uh, so the title track, uh, Zoot Suit Funk, came to me, uh, usually when songs come to me, they, they come, the whole song comes uh, at once. And so um, I thought, I, I, you know, I, I was, in my head, I was dancing to this song, like, well, this is a groovy little tune here. And it reminded me a little bit of, of Motown. And it also reminds some people of New Orleans. And uh, I just, I, I just wanted to have, have a song that People could feel good and you know get the little dance in the kitchen <laughs> type thing while they're washing the dishes or something. And uh, for some reason, when the song came to my mind, also what came to my mind was the the movie that had that Spike Lee had. I think it might have been it might have been Malcolm X, mm. where the guys were walking around in the zoo suits. That image came into my my head and of them talk, taking these high steps, you know, and walking around in these zoo suits. And so I said, hmm, well, I guess that's what I'm going to name the song then. <laughs> so that's, what, that's how I got its name, Zoo Suit Song. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, uh, and, and, and a couple of other tunes that are on the CD are actually songs that I wrote in college mm -hmm. uh, back, in, back, back in the day when I was doing my uh, juries. They call them juries. Um, which is basically a uh, final exam of a performance for your professors. And I wrote those uh, having fun and space goddess in, in back then when I, before I graduated from college and I had never recorded them. And so I decided to, you know, go ahead and go ahead and put them on, 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 on wax, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And, um, well, that's a long time to have things in the treasure trove and, uh, not um, yeah. do anything with the, that material, but that goes to show, doesn't it? Sometimes things, you know, if you if you sit on them long enough, uh, you there's a time for them to expose themselves, and I guess that's what you've done. You've incorporated that into your new CD. And um, so, how has COVID changed your overall overall schedule? And what was the was this the uh, the impetus for the new CD? A way of remaining busy throughout the lockdown period. We recorded this CD, believe it or not, in one day. <laughs> how, many, how many songs? Ten songs? Nine songs Nine in songs. one day. And I didn't intend for it to be that way, but we were working at a studio, and the, the, the engineer uh, that the studio used was from out of town. And so he only had like a couple of days. So it was like, okay, we got we to gotta do this we got to do the recording part 
and then you know we do the the mixing part tomorrow mm -hmm. so that's that's what happened so n nine songs in one day i'm telling you all live it all live yeah. and so it was it was quite uh quite the challenge by the cuz by the time i got to the i think we started at about uh hmm, two o'clock or something like that mm -hmm. and we finished at about 11 wow. or 11 30 and by the time i got to that last song i was pretty tired it might show in in, <laughs> in my solo on zeus because i was just i was exhausted i was like okay I, my ideas was like short uh, and i was <laughs> <laughs> it's like I just was trying to get through the song, but you know, after listening back, I said, "Well, that wasn't too bad." <laughs> but yeah, so was that because of the engineer's timing that you had to sort of rush it through? Or mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, we had we had, we only we only had that day to do the recording. Wow! And everybody everybody did such a good job, you know, uh, you know, um, uh, st stepping up to the plate and getting that done. How many um, takes did, for the song did you do? Mm -hmm. Did you do multiple takes for each song? Um, we did have, uh, yeah, we did do. There was one, one, one or two songs that we did uh, multiple takes on, and then there, was, of course, there was some overdubs that people mm -hmm. wanted to go back in and and do something over. You know, it's still but, pretty good going. You know, from two o'clock to eleven o'clock. Yeah, it was Nine songs. That was something. <laughs> it's like, that's like a night at Bird's Basement. That's right. That's you know? right. That's right. So, um, so yeah, so that's, um, that's, that's, yeah, so that's, uh, that's how that CD came together. So my plan initially, cause actually the recording was done in, in 2019. Okay. And I was going to put it out, uh, you know, after, by the time I got the graphics done and all the little knickknacks and stuff that needs to get done, you know, when you're putting out a CD, uh, it was, we were into 2020. Mm. And so I was like, okay, I'm going to release it in March of, of 2020. Forget it. <laughs> Corona said, uh-uh, girl, you're not releasing it in March of 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and so I was like, okay, well, <sighs> let's see. Now what? So. Uh, it kind of just kind of sat, you know, sat around. I, I, yeah. I did tweak a couple of things on the graphic tip. And uh, I, so then I was going to release it uh, uh, in October mm. of 2020. And then my, my manager uh, said, no, don't don't release it in, in October. She, I, I, I just have this feeling. Just don't. No, don't do it. And I was like, well, it'll probably be right. No, please don't do it. So then I I, I called the guy who's uh, helping me doing radio promotion. And so I asked him about it. And he said, yeah, you should probably wait till 2021. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I said, okay, all right. That's two people now that told me to wait till 2021. So I said, okay. So so that's when I decided to release it uh, this month. You right. know, uh, right. I mean, last month, January of 2021. Yeah. Yeah, actually, about two weeks ago now, and uh, which is pretty good timing because you, like you say, you're coming out of um, lockdown, so you're starting to gig, so you might be able to do a launch and all that sort of thing. Or have you done a launch? Yeah, I'm. Th I'm probably going to do that more towards the summer. Mm. Um, I'm actually, actually, now I'm really glad I did release it in 20, 2021 mm. because um, things might be a little. They got the vaccine now. Things might be a little better. Okay, and so. Um, I will probably do something when the weather warms up a little bit because that's when you, people can do outside concerts. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I have something planned pr probably sooner than summer, though. I'm, I might do something uh, in, like, April or something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Yeah. Of course, I, I wish uh, Bird's Basement would open back up so, yeah. <laughs> so we can down there <laughs> you'll be especially no flying for a few more years i don't think yeah especially because i there's a dj that's playing me uh lynn da i think his name is lynn davis yes 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 yeah. he is he's, he's he's he has started to play me now he has so. and he saw you at birds actually ah okay, okay. Yeah, he was a frequent um patron at birds Oh, nice. It used to be nice. on uh, PBS FM, which was a community radio station for many years. 
Okay. And now he's got his own radio station. I think it's out in the southern suburb somewhere in the yeah. beautiful hills of uh, Fern Tree Gully or something like that. But uh, he's a lovely guy. He's very supportive. He's very, uh, he's very knowledgeable about uh, American music, mm. especially jazz, fusion. Yeah. Uh, you know, blues. I, I do appreciate him. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I yeah totally. I mean, it's good to have someone in your in your in your um, pocket, isn't it? Who's supporting yeah. you, you know, some way? Because yeah. it's yeah. a it's a murky water out there, isn't it? Because to trying to yeah. get through that water. Yeah, it, it is, and I, I appreciate you too, Pete. Thank you for having me here. <laughs> you, no problem at all. It's always uh, great to talk to wonderful people like yourself. Oh, thank you. Actually, I'm, and plus the fact I'm really glad to see you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? The next question I've got for you is how have you experienced any, have you experienced any barriers being a woman who plays the drums? Has this changed over time for women playing music? Yes, indeed. Because I'm going to tell you what, <laughs> when I was growing up, when I tell you I felt like a lone female drummer, I, I said, there's no one else. There's no other woman in this entire planet that's playing drums. There's just, there's not, it can't be. I know, I don't see, there, there's no one. <laughs> Cindy Blackman. <laughs> huh? Cindy Blackman. Yeah, but but when I'm talking about when I was little, oh, like, right. I, yeah. you know, I start, when I got about 10 years old, I'm thinking, well, I guess there are no girls doing this. You know, I'm in school, there's no girls playing drums. Everywhere I went, there was no girls playing drums. And I started to feel, actually get a little frustrated because um, I, I I remember being at school and actually I was playing saxophone uh, from sixth grade to 12th grade in the concert band. And I didn't start playing drums in school until high school. But one day in elementary school, I just happened to get on the drums for some reason and play them to everybody's astonishment. <laughs> and <they're> like, <laughs> and uh, after I got done, the boys were looking real, real strange. And uh, the girls were like, wow, you play the drums. I said, mm -hmm, yeah, I play the drums. And then after school, I'm standing at the bus stop, uh, getting ready to take the bus home. And there's another little girl standing next to me. And she looked at me and her face screwed all up. And I said, what's wrong with you? <laughs> she said, you were playing the drums. I said, yeah. And she said, drums are for boys. You're, you're not supposed to be playing drums. And I was so hurt. I was upset. I said, well, I'm a girl and I like playing drums. <laughs> but you're not supposed to be playing. So I was that hurt me to the core. And I felt so bad that when I got home, I was going to quit. I was like, you know what? Maybe I'll just play saxophone. You know, I'll just I'll just play the sax. You know, that, that that seems to be a little more better for people, a little better for people. But little did uh my father know, he didn't know that I was feeling this way. And he went to uh he went to New York to do a gig. And when he came back, he was all excited. Now, I never told him that I was what had ha what happened with the little girl or I was thinking about quitting. He didn't know any of that. But the first thing out his mouth when he saw me, he said, guess what? I said, what? I saw another little girl playing drums. I said, really? And she's about eight years old. And I'm I, like I said, I was 10 at the time. I said, oh my goodness. I said, what is her name? And he said, her name is Terry Lynn Carrington. And she was playing with Clark Terry. <laughs> I said, oh my God, I was so excited excited and happy and and it just it changed my whole thing all I, that's all i needed to know that there was another little girl playing those drums yeah. and i got so happy and i said okay that's great and then i thought oh i'm not the only one playing girl playing drums hmm let me go practice <laughs> since i'm what not did, alone what, what did you think of karen carpenter because that would have been during that you know your adolescence well I can honestly say I didn't know that she was a drummer okay. uh, for many years until yeah. later I, I found right. out that she was a drummer. So I didn't know about her really. Um, 
That's but a, because in Australia, back in the mid seventies, say that again. In 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 Australia, in the mid seventies, uh, she had her own um, TV show. I'm pretty sure they had their own TV show. Oh, uh, yeah, that's oh. how I knew them because they were on uh, prime time television, being beamed all over Australia at prime, you know, prime time on a I think it was a Saturday night or something at six o'clock or something, seven o'clock or something like that. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. That, well, see, I, I didn't find out to, about her till way later, like in my twenties or so. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and, and I was, I was surprised, you know, cause I didn't know she, I didn't know she played drums. I, I think I knew her more uh, as a singer mm. uh, more than a drummer. So I didn't know she played like that mm. as, but yeah. So I, you know, I, after that, you know, um, so then, of course, you know, growing as there were still problems. And then, of course, Straight Ahead came along, which is all female. And so when we first started coming into the scene uh, back in the uh, late 80s, uh, we were getting looked at cross-eyed, too. Some people, most people were intrigued mm-hmm. by us because uh, we got our start at a at a club in Detroit <laughs> uh, by a lady named Mickey Braden, who was the vocalist at the time and she asked us to do this gig on a monday night which is a horrible night for a club Mm -hmm. date and (laughs) the first night we played there i think there was two people maybe three maybe five (laughs) and i don't know those five people went and told five more people that hey there's this all female jazz group playing down at burt's and next week the next uh week we played because we were doing this every week the next week we played there was like 10 more people <laughs> and those 10 people must have went and said oh my god this is all female <laughs> so by the end of the month there was a line going outside of bakers waiting to come in to see us because of this phenomenon of women jazz musicians and so we when we started when we got signed to atlantic and we started touring you know the sound guys <laughs> the sound guys boy they would be looking at us like and these girls gonna do they not gonna they're not gonna do anything you know <laughs> they would be giving us the side eye and you know you could tell they they wasn't respected us a whole lot and then after the show the whole attitude of those guys would be totally different <laughs> they would be like wow you guys were really good <laughs> you guys were really good that was that was really awesome and you know so I was just glad that they didn't keep the attitude after we played. They they had a lot more respect for us, you yeah, know. Totally, because we, we weren't tipping tiptoeing through the tulips. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> but you know, now of course it's a whole different world. Uh, thanks to you know, th- thanks to my generation of drummers, Karen Carpenter, Cindy Blackman, Terry Lynn Carrington, mm-hmm. Sheila E. Yeah. Uh, and and others, yeah. we paved the way for what we see in now, which is a plethora of female yes. drummers. It's a whole lot of them now, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> which of course thrills me to yeah. death. I'm just, I'm so glad to see all these girls playing drums now. Um, there's a there's a site on Instagram called Female Drummers, and they have like a hundred and five something thousand followers, wow. and uh, they feature all female drummers because I put my I put a video up there just a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. And uh it was awesome. They had they have like th- thousands of female drummers uh, that they um that they promote, you know, on a regular basis. And uh was, you know then there's the there's the, the pocket queen. She's got like three hundred and thirty three thousand followers on Instagram and you know it, so it's it's a lot more it's a lot uh, more acceptable now uh, to see for everybody to see a, a female drummer. It's not, it's not like uh, taboo anymore. <laughs> yeah. It's amazing, yeah. isn't it? How how it's come around um, because, she, like you say, Sheila Ree was one of the because of her uh, relationship with Prince mm-hmm. really um, changed things. I, knew, I think she was the marker. Where it really did change. Things. I do too. Yeah. I do too because uh, when she came, I was I think I was was she was I seventeen or sixteen when she came out with Glamorous Life, 
And I first of all, I loved the song. I used to, ooh, that song was so funky. And then when I saw her playing it, I was like, oh, mm. wow. <laughs> so yeah, that gave me a whole new level of 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 uh, love for for women playing drums. Then later on, I actually met uh, Roxy Petitucci. Okay. Uh, I mean, not Petitucci, Petucci, I think her name, Roxy Petucci. Then I met Gina Shock and from the Go-Go's. And uh, I think Ro Ro Roxy played with Vixen. And so I was like, okay, yeah, <laughs> this is great. This is great. This is, great. This is a pathway. Yeah. It's a pathway now. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So, what are your favorite rituals when you're when you're touring, and what keeps you focused? Oh, um, well, first of all, sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Because, <laughs> woo, uh, like I know coming over, over to Australia, uh, man, that, that time, that time, time change was slapping me upside my head. <laughs> so, so it was very important that I, you know, could get some sleep. Uh, that, that's the first thing is, is rest. Rest is very important. Um, uh, usually uh, I'm on the if, when I'm in the on the plane. Well, before I go even go, I, I focus on the music that I'm playing, and making sure that I'm you know living with the music. You know, with my headphones, listening to it constantly, so I can get you know keep it get it in my head real good. And uh, you know, uh, just the preparation of of getting ready to to go on tour, making sure I have everything that I need. Um, on the plane, I'm listening to the music and, and resting, and um, that's those are the kinds of things that I, I do before I uh, before I embark on a tour. I just make sure that I'm real comfortable with the music um, and that I have everything I need uh, on the road uh, that that'll help me be comfortable while while I'm traveling, and then uh, rest, of course, like I said, and then uh, you know, of course, a good um, rehearsal before the actual show is good. That's why I was, you know, just, just like we come in early. Aretha always had us come in a day early, you know, yeah. before the show to go through the music and make sure everybody was comfortable and stuff. So my focus is mainly uh, on the music at, at that point when I'm preparing for a tour and making sure that I'm prepared, you know, yeah. and ready to go. Yeah. Internally. It's been great talking with you too, Gailene. Oh, my pleasure. My yeah, pleasure. Take care. Yeah, you too, Pete. And I, I, I hope I get to see you in, in the near future, you know, hopefully in 2022. Yeah, totally. That'd be fantastic. You must have cast a spell.